Now, one interesting um, tidbit um, from this and in, in, in an interesting aspect of metabolism is that the longer insulin is reduced and the body is in fat burning, the more the body begins to burn more fat than it needs in order to meet its metabolic needs. Specifically, if we look at the liver, if insulin has been reduced for a substantial period of time, the liver, like many cells of the body, is primarily burning fat for fuel. It's in fat burning mode. And in fact, the fat burning goes on so much that it, it because of the low insulin, the liver in a way can't stop burning fat. And normally, a cell will burn as much energy as it needs ATP. I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but eight, or to say that another way, the cell will burn as much energy as it needs to do work. You know, so the cell has a certain work demand and it will burn enough energy to meet that demand. But if insulin is low for an extended period of time, the body, the liver in particular, continues to burn so much fat that it starts to burn more than it needs to meet its own energetic needs. And that excess is essentially what becomes ketones. Now, my point in bringing that kind of complicated description and introduction to ketones up is only that that can become a bit of a surrogate marker. If you are with regards to your metabolic flexibility or metabolic health, if you have fasted for let's say 16 hours and you have a way of measuring your ketones and you find that your blood ketone levels are still really low um, or undetectable, that suggests that you have high insulin levels because insulin would stop, if insulin is high, it would stop the fat burning, which would stop the production of ketones, a process that is called ketogenesis. Insulin inhibits ketogenesis. And so if you've entered a, what should be a fasted state, but your insulin is still sufficiently high to inhibit ketogenesis, so your ketones are low, you have poor metabolic flexibility, or in other words, you are metabolically inflexible. In contrast, if you've fasted for about 16 or so hours, certainly um, this would be the case with even longer fasts, and you do see that you have entered into a higher level of ketones, whether you're measuring it in your breath or your urine or your blood with a finger stick, then you can be pretty confident that you have good metabolic flexibility, that in this fasted state, you had shifted to fat burning. And to say that all another way, you'd have good confidence that you are, that you have good insulin sensitivity. But the last part of the lesson I wanted to discuss today is just to um, revisit this idea of how common the problem is. Why is it that insulin resistance has, been, has become the single most common health problem worldwide? There are two things that I want to touch on. The first is that we that our general medical or biomedical view and approach and the clinical approach to insulin resistance has actually inadvertently made the problem worse. So in this case, we've sort of selectively looked at certain aspects of the science surrounding insulin resistance and unwittingly uh, accelerated the problem. When most medically trained individuals or average individuals as well who have no formal medical training hear the term insulin resistance or even when they just hear the word insulin they immediately think of one thing you think of glucose you think of diabetes every time in fact just as a point of interest you'll notice over my shoulder for those of you that are watching i have a copy of my book why we get sick that book is as a sh shameless plug all about insulin resistance including everything we're talking about this month why didn't i call it insulin resistance, why it matters and what to do about it, because I knew nobody would buy it. They would immediately look at that title and just assume this was a book about diabetes and they would think, well, I don't have diabetes, so I don't care. But that's not the case, but that is why the partly why the problem has become so prevalent. It's that we look at insulin resistance as a glucose problem. But earlier in my description and my definition of insulin resistance, what did I say was elevated? Did I say that the glucose is elevated in insulin resistance? No, I didn't. I said that the insulin is elevated in insulin resistance. And that therein lies the problem. That insulin resistance, also known as prediabetes, is a state where insulin levels are higher by necessity because insulin isn't working very well. And it also is that elevated insulin is both cause and consequence. And we'll revisit that next week. But 
Elevated insulin is a cardinal feature of insulin resistance. The body has to work harder, insulin has to work harder and higher in order to keep glucose levels in check. But it is capable of keeping glucose levels in check. And so you have an individual who may be manifesting year over year as they come into their clinic for their annual visit with various signs and symptoms of insulin resistance, like, for example, all of the features save the high glucose of the metabolic syndrome. They have higher blood pressure. They have dyslipidemia. They have elevated waist circumference. And the clinician is only measuring the glucose, which is coming up as normal every time. And so they say everything's fine. However, if they were to expand their view of the problem to include insulin as a marker, they would find that insulin levels can be elevated up to 20 years before glucose levels ever start to change.